the reading today is Jonah chapter 1 and chapter 2. Jonah flees from the Lord. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittal. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, Tell us, who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He answered, I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. This terrified them and they asked, what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he'd already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they asked him, What should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they couldn't, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not, account, do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man, for you, Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. Then it's Jonah's prayer. From inside the fish Jonah prayed in the Lord, to the Lord his God. He said, In my distress I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From the depth of the grave I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the deep, into the very heart of the seas, and the currents swirled around me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again towards your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me from forever, but you brought my life up from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit, forfeit the grace that would be theirs. But I, with the song of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. Salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. We were on the A1 last week, travelling back to Sheffield, and we got stuck in quite a significant tailback. Um, A motorhome had broken down on the hard shoulder, um, and the traffic ground to a halt. Um, Police cars were trying to get through the middle of the two lines. We were slugging along um, for quite a long time. And just as we were approaching the back of... Um, the tailback, just as we could sort of see it coming up and Nick, who was driving, was slowing down. Um, He said, 
Um, oh, if I'd have seen this 30 seconds earlier, we could have turned off. And we both had a, a collective moment of tutting and eye rolling as, as the exit that we'd just passed kind of disappeared into the rear view mirror. Um, and it occurred to me, we don't really like journeys, do we? We're always looking for ways to get from A to B that bit quicker. Davo, is it dead crackly? Do you want me to use the other one? Yeah, hang on, bear with. The HS2 railway, um, which is currently being built across much of the country, is a good example, isn't it? Um, the new London to Birmingham route will apparently be 29 minutes quicker than the old one. It's going across ancient woodland, but hey, 29 minutes. You know, just think what you can do with 29 minutes. Um, we're all about the destination, if we're honest. We don't like the delay. And so we come to the next part in our journeys series, which is Jonah's journey. And I wonder if anyone else has realized that we've effectively been hearing the same story for the last few weeks. God seems to keep telling his people to go on a journey. The Israelites, is it going to work? It will if you turn it on, Claire. Yes. The Israelites, here we are, they leave Egypt, they're heading for the promised land, but in between, 40 years in the wilderness. Oh no. There we go, we've got it, it's working. Um, last week Amy told us Elijah defeats the prophets of Baal. Um, yeah, can you press it, Davo, is that all right? Thank you. Um, there it is. He anoints Elisha to take on his work, but in between we have the desert. 40 days and 40 nights in the desert where he prays, I have had enough, Lord, take my life. And now we get to Jonah. Jonah is told to go to Nineveh. He flees from Nineveh, but eventually he does get there and we're told the Ninevites believed God and turned from their evil ways. But in the middle of it all, everything goes wrong and he ends up inside the belly of the whale for three days. If Davo pressed the slide again, you can see it's the same story. And in each of these stories, the narrative focus the thing that the writer is drawing our attention to is the middle bit. It's the wilderness. It's the desert. It's the whale. It's what happens as we're along the way. And as I've been preparing this, I found myself wondering, why is that? What is it? in the middle of the story where everything seems to be going wrong that God is wanting to teach us. Andy told us three weeks ago that the wilderness was where the Israelites learned to trust God. Amy said last week that the desert is where Elijah learns to experience God's presence. And this week, it's in the belly of the whale where Jonah learns to do what God wants. And as a consequence, a whole population are changed as a result. It seems that the journey is where the learning happens. It's where the growth happens. But Jonah's journey has differences too. For one thing, it tells us that trying to run away from God is a really bad idea and that if you're wise, you won't even attempt it. But I'm struck by just what it takes to get Jonah to surrender to God's plan. I don't know if there's ever been an award ceremony for the most stubborn Bible character in, in history, but if there is, I reckon that Jonah could possibly take the top slot. 
He's told to go to Nineveh. He refuses. He boards the ship for Tarshish in the opposite direction. A great wind comes and a violent storm hits and he sleeps through both of them. The captain urges him to pray to his God for his deliverance. He doesn't. They cast lots to identify Jonah as the cause of their calamity and he does nothing. And it's only when the sea gets so rough that their survival is in serious doubt that he finally says, pick me up and throw me into the sea and it will become calm. Finally admitting, I know it is my fault. We're not always quick to admit to our mistakes, are we? And in the meantime, people and things get hurt. I wonder how long those sailors had PTSD for as a consequence of Jonah's disobedience. But it's what happens next that I think is really interesting. Despite all Jonah's running away and all his disobedience and all his sticking collective two fingers up to God and say, I'm not interested, Lord, the Lord provides a great fish to swallow Jonah and Jonah was inside it for three days and three nights. But it can't really get much worse than this, can it? Jonah himself refers to it as the depths of the grave. And in some ways, I think this is a fate worse than death for Jonah. He doesn't know that the sea has calmed and the storm has stopped. Perhaps he's sitting there thinking he's got um, the death of a ship full of innocent sailors on his conscience. He's entirely at the mercy of the whale. He's directionless purposeless, aimless, helpless, and hopeless. He is sitting in the dark, and I love the, these pictures that you get of Jonah in the belly of the whale. Like, he wouldn't have been able to see anything. Every picture that's ever been illustrated for this should just really be pitch blackness. Um, he's sitting in the dark inside a huge fish that he has no way out of. He can do nothing to change his circumstances. He is, to put it bluntly, screwed. And it's now, and now only, that he prays. I think God must have been watching him the entire time and thinking, when are you going to turn to me, Jonah? What is it going to take? I wonder if there's ever been a time in your life where you had to hit rock bottom before you were prepared to change your ways, before you were prepared to let God in and have his way in your life. I know there has in mine. We can try, can't we, to hold on to our own way and our old way of doing things. But it only causes more and more distress until we finally learn, as Jonah did, to cry out to the Lord in our anguish. And it's at that moment the moment of surrender, that the whale stops being a tomb for Jonah and becomes more of a womb instead. A place where he is rebuilt and repurposed and restored and reborn into a new direction. And so the belly of the whale, like the desert, like the wilderness, becomes a place of intimacy with God. 
a place of honesty and of prayer and of worship and of talking face to face with God as a man talks with a friend. Jonah needed the whale for his very survival. We need the whale. We need that time where it's just us and God, with no distractions or diversions or busyness, to reset and realign our priorities with his. You don't have to be a prophet to realize that the world is in a bit of a mess right now. Political turmoil, environmental emergency, financial chaos, the storm is here and it's happening. I think God is calling us into the belly of the whale, into a place of repentance and lament in our own lives first and foremost, into a place of looking honestly at the state of our own hearts and then inviting him in to change them. It's easy to think that the problems are out there and to miss the fact that first and foremost, there are problems in here. As Jonah prays so eloquently, when he finally gets around to it, those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. I think the Lord is urging us this morning not to cling to worthless idols, to give up and throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and to come face to face again with the God who loves us. Because I am convinced that life with God is better than life without him. No one knows you like God does. No one loves you like God does. No one is more deeply committed to you than God is. And all the time I think God is saying to Jonah, I've got something better for you than this. His ways are not our ways, as Amy said last week. His ways are better than our ways. We just have to be willing to accept them. So let's pray. Lord, wherever we are at this morning, may we know that you are the God who rescues us out of the mess of our own making. Help us, Lord, to be honest with you, to open our hearts and our lives to you again, to let you into our darkness so that you can redeem and restore and transform it in your glorious light. Come, Lord Jesus, This morning, right now, we pray. Amen. I just want to invite you to stay seated and we're going to use this song as a reflection. And it's a song based on Psalm 42, but the the last verse is actually taken from Jonah's prayer. And it's it's a song of lament and we don't often do songs of lament in church. And um, when, in a time in mine and Claire's life, when we were in the belly of the whale, about 12 years ago, um, this was literally like the only song we felt like we could sing with any integrity. So I just want to invite you just to, to listen prayerfully and worshipfully as I sing this over you. I have lost my appetite And the flood is welling up behind my eyes So I eat the tears I cry And if that were not enough They know just the words to cut and tear and prod When they ask me where's your God Why are you downcast, oh my soul? 
why so disturbed within me I can remember when you showed your grace to me as a dear pants from water so my soul thirsts for you and when I survey your splendor you so faithfully renew like a bed of rest for my fainting I am satisfied in you When I'm staring at the ground It's an inbred feedback loop That drags me down So it's time to lift my brow And remember better days when I love to worship you and all your ways With the sweetest songs of praise Why are you downcast, O oh my soul? Why so disturbed within me? I can remember when you showed your face to me As a deer pants for water so my soul thirsts for you And when I behold your glory so faithfully renew Like a bed of rest for my fainting I am satisfied in you Let my sighs give way to songs to sing about your faithfulness Let my pain reveal your glory is my only real rest Let my loss show me all You're the one who made the waves And your son went out to suffer in my place And to tell me that I'm safe So why am I down? And why so disturbed? I am satisfied in you I am satisfied in you I am satisfied in you